All right, welcome back, everybody. So our next presenter is Jessica Shem. Jessica graduated from UCSB with a degree in marine biology and a minor in spatial science. After working as an environmental consultant for four years, she decided she really wanted to get back to what she was passionate about, marine science and conservation. During her year at Scripps, she was excited to do a capstone project that really embodies the interdisciplinary nature of the program. And after graduation, she's excited to have a job as the NOAA Marine Debris Field Technician in Hawaii. Ow! There she will be doing surveys and removals of marine debris in the northern remote islands of Papahanaumokuakea National Monument. So when the person uh, who hired Jessica called me for a reference check, it just struck me as so hilarious because one of the questions that he asked me was, so, you know, is Jessica, is she comfortable in the water? <laughs> And I thought a little bit about it. I, you know, try not to laugh, but um, you know, Jessica is a water woman, right? She grew up sailing. She's a science diver. We did our swim assessment, and I'll never forget. I think we had to swim like 400 meters in, I don't, 12 or 14 minutes or something. Just did it in eight. And I remember Dr. Smith looked at me and was just like, Jess just dominated that pool. <laughs> she just dominated it. So it was so fantastic to be at places like Catalina Island with Jess where she could really um, support some of those who didn't have as much experience in the water, who didn't know the island as well, who had never had buffalo milk before, um, and who needed a little support when it came to snorkeling and laying transects. So Jess has really brought that love of water and that confidence in the water to this cohort, and it's been really, really um, impressive and really, really helpful to the cohort. So please join me in welcoming Jessica Shem. Good morning, my name is Jessica Shem, and I would like to talk to you a little bit about my experiences developing a marine management plan for the island of Montserrat. Now some of you may be thinking, where's Montserrat? Don't worry, I thought the same thing when I first started this project. Montserrat is a small volcanic island located in the northeastern Caribbean. It's a self-governing British overseas territory. Montserrat is in some ways like your typical Caribbean island paradise. It is beautiful blue oceans teeming with marine life, extremely nice people who are always welcoming, lush greenery everywhere you look, and a very laid back atmosphere. However, in some ways, Montserrat is nothing like the island paradise you are thinking about right now. This is Montserrat, and so is this. About 25 years ago, the Sufria Hills volcano became active and erupted after being dormant for almost 500 years. The island went from looking like this to looking like this. The eruption caused an island-wide evacuation, and when they returned, they found that two-thirds of the island were covered in ash. Plymouth, their capital, was completely destroyed, along with the airports, shipping ports, schools, and the only hospital on the island. Out of the 15,000 people who had lived there originally, only 5,000 even returned. To this day, two-thirds of the island are now considered unsafe and closed to the public. That's that whole area to the south. The eruption of Sufria Hills was wide, had widespread devastation, but I know you're all wondering, what does this have to do with the ocean? Well, the devastation didn't stop on land. It continued into the ocean, where runoff and sedimentation still continue to be an issue. However, even in the face of all this destruction, the people of Montserrat continued to be optimistic and hopeful. Prior to the eruption, Montserrat had recognized the need for conservation and had even started developing new laws for implementation. However, this was all put on hold when the volcano erupted and nothing was actually implemented. Recognizing the increased need for conservation, Montserrat, the Montserrat government reached out, reached out to the Waite Institute. The Waite Institute is a nonprofit, or, nonprofit organization with the mission of empowering communities to restore their oceans. Through their partnership, Waite and Montserrat created Montserrat Blue Halo, and this was formed with the goals of creating a community-based plan that focused on ecosystem health and ocean-based economics. In order to achieve these goals, the marine, a marine spatial, the, uh, sorry, the marine spatial planning process was used. The marine spatial planning process is essentially a way to divide up the ocean 
for the different uses in order to meet environmental, economic, and social objectives. This process can lead to implementation of ocean zoning. Imagine you're going to spend a day at the beach. Some of you will grab a surfboard and a wetsuit, while others will just go for a little swim. Also, I can bet in this group there's a bunch who might want to go for a dive or even go fishing. Now imagine if you all showed up to the same spot to do the same activity. You'd have surfers running over swimmers and fishers catching divers. It would be absolute chaos. <laughs> now think about trying to do this for an entire island, and you can imagine how complicated it gets. We all use the ocean in our own ways, and marine spatial planning just finds a balance between these different activities. After multiple different drafts, this is what the current marine spatial plan looks like. The final consultation is currently underway, and this is the version that they th expect to be finalized next month. As you can see, the dark blue areas on the map are areas that are marine protected areas, and these are closed to all fishing or harmful uses. They're made to protect the habitat and fish populations. While the light blue areas are, also, are par partial take zones, which allow different forms of gear types to decrease the impact from fishing. The zones with the red dots are actually, were actually implemented before this project because those are the vol volcanic exclusion zones, which are close to all activity in case the volcano becomes active again. All these zones were proposed and drawn by the people of Montserrat to fit their needs and accomplish their conservation plans. So everything that I've mentioned up to this has been going on in the last four years with Waite Institute in Montserrat. This is where I became involved. When I got to grad school, I wanted to branch out and do things that I hadn't normally gotten the chance to. Like Samantha mentioned, I graduated with, marine, with a marine biology degree and worked as an environmental scientist. After hearing that Waite was looking for someone to help with this process, I became really excited to participate in a project where I could gain experience in all aspects of ocean management. I was also very excited that the plan I would create would actually be put into effect and that my ideas would help guide Montserrat to a sustainable ocean future. So now that you know what a marine spatial plan is, uh, a marine, what do you think a marine management plan is? Well, a marine management plan is essentially a roadmap to ha from, how to get to the from how to get from the marine spatial plan to implementation and future sustainability. It identifies who is responsible, what they are responsible for, and when things need to get done. My capstone was basically broken down into two main parts. Part one was to find the most successful ways to implement the marine management plan in an area of low capacity and low resources like Montserrat. I decided to start this project with an independent study where I reviewed marine management plans from other islands in the Caribbean. Many of these plans were also created for small island developing nations, and many of which also had very low capacity for marine conservation. As I reviewed these plans, it was a little disheartening to read about how much of the environment was deteriorating. Over and over, I read about the anthropogenic influence on the oceans and how coral reefs were disappearing but some areas were experiencing it more than others. It's estimated that a total of 70% of the coral reefs occur in developing nations. This is a huge percentage of coral reef occurring in areas where marine conservation isn't a priority. Like Montserrat, many Caribbean islands had natural disasters that impacted the health of their reefs. This, along with the anthropogenic stress, was not a good combination. The good news in all this is that even though funding and capacity are low, the drive for marine conservation is very high. Reading through all these management plans gave me a solid foundation of what I wanted to include in the management plan for Montserrat. My second objective was to evaluate the capacity of Montserrat and find tangible steps to make sure the marine management plan was followed. As an outsider coming in to Montserrat, I didn't want to be just another person telling them how to fix their reefs. It's very important to me that this was their plan and I was just there to provide ideas, information, and support. After creating, an on the, after creating an outline with some preliminary information, I was lucky enough to travel to Montserrat and share my ideas with some of the members of the steering committee. While I was initially concerned with how to drive on the left side of the road and how to navigate in unfamiliar places, thank goodness for downloading Google Maps, I quickly became distracted trying to figure out how I could create this plan for Montserrat. How could I design a plan in line with the priorities and capacity of Montserrat? How could I make it a plan that they could eventually take ownership of? And this is what I spent the last couple of months doing. 
I had an amazing trip to Montserrat. The island is known for being friendly and laid back, and I definitely experienced that. During my visit, I got to meet with many stakeholders, including government officials, marine police, fishermen, and educators. I really enjoyed getting to know them and listening to their stories and ideas for what they wanted included in a marine management plan. I was able to dig deeper into the day-to-day -day operations, cost, capacity, and issues on Montserrat. When I returned from Montserrat, I quickly got to work incorporating all these ideas and input into a comprehensive ocean management plan. The plan as the plan developed, five main sections stood out. The management framework, which summarizes roles and responsibilities, education and outreach, which supports a better understanding for the, of the plan, compliance and enforcement, which is necessary to make sure rules are followed, research and monitoring, which allows us to track changes in the marine environment resulting from this increased marine management, and sustainable finance, which outlines ways to fund this whole process now and into the future. Because each one of these sections could be a whole presentation in itself, I'm only going to briefly discuss three of them, the marine management framework, education and outreach, and compliance and enforcement. The, marine, the management framework of Montserrat is very complicated, as you can see by this figure. This section lays out the roles and responsibilities of everyone involved and in the marine management planning process. One aspect of this uh, section that I am really excited about is the Marine Spatial Plan Coordinator. Montserrat's lack of capacity for natural resource management is a fundamental barrier to their progress. While this is not actually an official position, we are working on securing grant funding to create it. This person would work closely with all the stakeholders and help oversee the implementation process. Outreach and education are essential tools in achieving success in ocean conservation. Not only does it inform people about the rules and regulations, making them much easier to follow, it helps people realize why marine management is necessary. During Blue Halo Montserrat community consultations, it became evident that there was a clear lack of knowledge about the marine environment. When asked about the health of their ecosystems, more than a half reported that they do not know Montserrat's if Montserrat's reefs are healthy or unhealthy, and still one-fifth could not assess the state of Montserrat's fish stocks. This clearly showed that the community needed more information about the marine environment that they have. I know for me, the more I learn, and probably many of you, the more I learn about the ocean environment and how much we depend on it, the more I want to conserve it. My plan, in my plan, I recommended increasing outreach and education, especially for children, so that they can become ocean stewards before it's too late. In order to raise awareness, foster ownership, and promote learning, I recommended the following education and outreach ob objectives. A short film about the importance of ocean management and specifically how it applies to Montserrat. Informational pamphlets to be distributed to locals and visitors. Presentations in schools and summer camps about the importance of the ocean. The use of social media to raise awareness. Public outreach events and training courses, such as swimming lessons, lifeguarding, marine conservation, and diving. In many areas, the success of ocean conservation was greatly increased when there was a local champion to help support and encourage the community. The people of Montserrat are more likely to listen to someone who they grew up with and live with than somebody like me who's an outsider and barely knows them. I'm going to show you a quick film of one of our collaborators who is a great example of an ocean champion working locally in Montserrat. Hi, my name is Vita Wade. I was born on the tiny island of Montserrat. Living on an island, the ocean is, of course, very special to me. Fish and Fins is a kids club that I started to get the children of Montserrat engaged with the sea. We teach them how to snorkel, how to swim, and really to just understand what's happening in the oceans around them. People protect what they love. Our mission at Fish and Fins is to inspire awareness and respect for our ocean. We are creating a generation of ocean leaders that will do the right things to preserve and protect our ocean's future. I think Vita Wade is a very inspiring woman, and I am happy that we will continue collaborating with her to educate the next generation of ocean stewards. Nope. <laughs> Montserrat offers unique challenges in regards to accessibility, size, and enforceability. Ultimately, it is also or unfortunately, it has struggled with the lack of human resources and adequate equipment for enforcement. In addition, there are long stretches of inaccessible beaches which make it difficult to enforce monitoring. 
However, during my trip to Montserrat, I also found out that they just had an 80-foot vessel donated from the UK, and they're planning on increasing their task force from eight people to 22. This is a huge step in being able to spend more time on the water and access more, side, more of the remote sides of the island. We are working with local contractors to set up training and create new protocols to help implement the marine spatial plan based on the needs of the island. My management plan was, the management plan that I created will serve as the first step in Montserrat's journey to ocean sustainability. This plan will be taken along with the Marine Spatial Plan and New Ocean Act, which provides the legal framework for implementation to the government. The government can then begin the implementation process, keeping adaptive management in mind and the, the, changing, and the changing plan with the changing ocean future. My hope is that my capstone will not only be important for Montserrat, but also help other Blue Halo Initiative sites in their efforts to promote and protect their oceans for future generations. I would really like to thank everyone who helped make this possible, especially my capstone committee, and my lovely MAS cohort, my amazing student mentor, Amanda, and my family. Thanks for all your love and support. Fantastic presentation, but I may be a little bit biased, but <laughs> in any case, um, maybe this is a tough question, Jessica, but I keep thinking about the impacts of this volcano and how it impacted the society, and you said two-thirds of the people left the island, and I keep wondering, you know, so many of the environmental plans that go on are in these pristine, beautiful areas, and you know, here's a place that's been devastated by a natural calamity. Do you think the impact of that calamity on the people's um, desire to protect the ocean environment increased because now they saw what was lost or could be lost? Or do you think maybe it was an apathy that developed, you know, well, anything can happen, so, you know, who really cares? I mean, did you have any sense for that? Um, I actually think that they increased. They realized that, so after the volcano exploded, the sedimentation and runoff were a huge impact on the reef and actually shifted their um, ecosystem to more of a sponge-based ecosystem. And I think that they've seen a decrease in the fish that they're able to catch. And I think that they realized that they need this for their environment. And I think that they definitely have a sense of uh, marine conservation and want to continue it. And they were the ones who reached out to wait. So I think they are interested in conserving their marine environment. Thank you. So I know that, um, first of all, awesome presentation, obviously. <laughs> but I know that marine management plans can be very expensive. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where the finances are coming from for the specific components of this plan. Yeah. Um, so actually, we had a whole section in the report about sustainable finance, which, because the report is so long, I had to cut out a few sections for the presentation. Um, but actually, last Friday, they just implemented a new ocean fund, which will house all of the donations and fees and fines um, to support the marine conservation. We're also looking into enacting a uh, marine conservation exit fee. So we wait had a sustainable finance plan and assessment prior to when I came on board, and it found that there was a few areas that could bring in money to the island, and we decided that the marine conservation exit fee would be one of the best, and that would just be a little fee that people pay when they leave the island, and it goes directly into the new ocean fund, and then that can help uh, with conservation on land and in the water. Thanks. Um I think that was your dad that asked that first question. <laughs> Just a hunch. But I had a similar question, and it related to, for as much of a disaster it was, the, the volcano sort of created a blank canvas, perhaps, and maybe a little bit more receptivity on the part of the locals to adopt a management plan. Um, I guess my first question would be, is that true? And then the second part of it is, are there some lessons learned from your experiences that could be maybe exported to other situations where maybe there weren't natural disasters in terms of how you would want to approach a community to promote a management plan like this? Yeah, I think that with the volcano, um, they realized that their need for marine conservation was actually increased and they didn't have as long as they thought before the reefs were deteriorating. 
Um, and so they definitely realized that they needed to get started on the process. And I think that you can kind of bring that to other areas and realizing that you don't know how long you have to protect your reefs and you need to start now. <laughs>